I've been wanting to do a 9-11 vs Evora comparison for a little while now, and this isn't the comparison that I had in mind, but in many ways it is a much more interesting one. In the 9-11 world, prices are a little bit haywire. There are plenty of 996s and 7s available from as little as £10,000, but they are close to 20 years old in some cases, and all but the newest ones have a reputation for expensive engine failure. Good examples can be had for around the £20,000 mark, with turbo and GT models being considerably more. If you own one of these 911s and want an upgrade, a newer Porsche with a revised engine can be more than double your money, and a Cayman or a Boxster might not appeal, especially if you have small children. So my question today is this, if you have a 911 like this one and fancy an upgrade, does the Lotus offer anything more and, most importantly, do you have to give anything up in the switch from Stuttgart's oldest to Hethel's newest? Representing the Porsche, we have the car even Porsche guys love to hate, the 996. When it was introduced in 1997, the purists decried the water-cooled engine and the new styling. But 20 years later, this car is actually quite raw compared with the more luxurious GT car that the 911 has become. Let's see how these two compare on paper. The 911 is a C4S, featuring four-wheel drive in the wider body shell from the turbo, as well as a few other parts like the brakes. The Evora is a launch edition, meaning it is one of the first made and was sold with most options included as standard. The only thing really missing is the close ratio gearbox, which was introduced later and eventually became standard fitment. The Lotus is around 7 years newer than the 911, but the 911 cost more when new. The Porsche is up on power compared to the Lotus, 40 horsepower clear. The torque advantage is slimmer, but the Porsche's muscular engine produces its peak figure considerably earlier than the Lotus. However, the Evora is more than 100 kilos lighter than the 911. The Lotus uses an aluminium tub with a fiberglass body compared to the Porsche's more traditional metal monocoque construction. That weight advantage means only a slight power to weight advantage for the Porsche. Both cars do the 0-62 sprint in the same time, although the Porsche takes the crown for top speed. The 996 was offered until 2004, this car being a 2002. List prices started at around £64,000, but with any Porsche that could be increased significantly in the options list. For the launch edition of Auras, almost all options were included already, so the £58,500 price tag was fairly representative of what you would have paid. The car was later available for around £50,000 with no options, and a supercharged model was later introduced which brought power up considerably to around 345 brake horsepower. It is the naturally aspirated car that we will be looking at today however, as those generally make up the cheapest of Auras on the market. Both cars are 2 plus 2s, both are sports cars with some GT potential. The first shock of the day comes in the interior. The 996 was Porsche's first 911 after their massive shake-up. That meant that in order for it to survive, the car shared huge numbers of parts with the then new Boxster, and the result is a car that is full of fairly cheap and not particularly pleasant switch gear. That being said, it does work well. There is a mixture of leather and scratchy cheap plastic, and if this was your first Porsche you wouldn't be very impressed. A BMW M3 from the same period has a much better feeling interior and was a much cheaper car at the time. The Lotus, on the other hand, is a feast of leather, curves and feels like a much more intimate and expensive place to be. The wraparound dash is great and although it's less spacious inside, it does feel like the more luxurious and special car of the two. Space is another victory to the Lotus. If you're using the back seats for storage, the high transmission tunnel in the Porsche can make things awkward. The Lotus's flat bench is more practical and the same goes for mounting a car seat. The Lotus also has a much larger boot at the rear of the car rather than the front. It's very wide, meaning you can just about fit a golf bag in it, something that's never going to happen in a 911. Both cars have similarly sized tyres and brakes, they both cost a similar amount to service and run, the difference is not really noteworthy. This 911's seal grey colour scheme won't turn any heads if that's what you want, but the Evora gets stares and remarks wherever it goes. The aquamarine blue is an unusual hue, and the paprika interior really sets this car apart. Lotus did make many improvements to the car during its lifespan, particularly in the interior, but well cared for examples still look superb, as this one demonstrates. Alright, so we're on the road in the 911. Now it's been nearly a couple of years since I drove a 911 when I sold mine and mine was a 996 as well and there's a few key differences between my car and this car which make them feel like completely different vehicles I know there's guys out there who say oh it's a 911 they're all the same they're all just Beatles and uh, 
all right, you know, they're not all universally loved, and that's fine. If you really don't want one, then you don't have to have one. But if you are interested in them, the things that make this car different are the lack of sports suspension. My car was specified with the sport suspension, which is called a M030 in Porsche speak, and that gave the car an incredibly hard ride. Now, sure, it made the car look a lot cooler because it sat that much lower, but it completely compromised the ride. The ride in this car is really, really nice. Very, very supple, very, very well suspended. I'm on a B road now, which is far, far, far from perfect, and it actually takes the lumps and bumps pretty well. In fact, it's not dissimilar to my Evora 400. The only difference I can say is that I drove this car yesterday and I was driving through a town called Berry St. Evans in the middle of Berry there is a section of cobbled or sort of you know roughly paved road uh, not unlike the sort of Belgian pave that auto manufacturers use to test their cars and on that road surface the 400 still feels suspended but in this car you can feel the suspension just reach the end of its travel you're just getting hit a little bit harder so you know the 911 does have a limit to what it can do but for the most part overall the suspension actually works really really well now this car is a later car than mine this is a 2002 which means it's a facelift model and it received the 3.6 liter engine power was only up about 20 horsepower over my car torque up by a, not a huge amount either but this car feels much much punchier than I can remember it feeling in mine. Mine was the 3.4 and really, really needed revs to get the best from it. Whereas this one, just you put your foot down and it's just instant response, even in fourth gear. That brings me on to another point. Compared with modern Porsches, the gears in this car are judged absolutely spot on. They are really, really nice and on a B road, first through fourth are getting frequent use and you occasionally sort of dip into fifth if you want to sort of relax for a minute and then sixth is fairly well judged for cruising. A lot of the modern cars have come under some considerable flack for having very very long gear ratios. The Boxster in particular because it has a smaller less torquey engine cannot pull some of the higher gears very effectively and you wind up finding out that actually second gear is what you need to overtake vehicles on a 60 mile an hour stretch of road and that's just a bit ridiculous because basically if you have this amazing gearbox that most Porsches do, then what's the point in making it so that you can't really use it? Now on that note, in this car the gearbox is so different to what I remember. Our Porsches usually come under immense praise for the quality of their gear shift and the gear shift in this car is fine. Never have used a shift, it's smooth, it's easy, every gear you know exactly when it's home. But it's a very long throw. Uh, it's almost a little bit vague in the center. It's so different to what I remember. I can't help but think that perhaps my car was fitted with a short shifter kit, or maybe I've just forgotten what it was like. Now compared to the Evora 400, this is a, uh, is a poor gearbox. It it's, lacks all of the feel and the precision that that car has. Now, how it will compare to the older Evora, we shall see. That car did come under some considerable criticism for the quality of its shift throughout its model run. They eventually improved it, but the car we're looking at today is an earlier one. When you put your foot down, you get a decent amount of shove, much, much more than you'd expect from a car with these sorts of numbers. But what you quickly realize is that the throttle has been set up in a way that it delivers nearly all of the engines go in the first sort of couple of centimeters of travel. So when you then decide, right, I'm going to push on and you press your foot flat to the floorboards, not much more actually happens. It's kind of uh, frustrating. And it's something I can't, again, remember having on my car. I prefer a linear throttle pedal myself. And it's certainly between that and the short gearing definitely help makes this car feel fast. But occasionally, I was driving this car earlier and driving it quite briskly and you think you're doing a fairly considerable speed and then you look down and you realize that actually you're not. Now, that in many, many ways is a very, very good thing because there's an awful lot of cars out there that disguise the rate of knots at which you travel and they can sort of take some of the fun out of it. 
but this car really really gives you the sensation of you being involved now because this car is a 4s obviously it is four wheel drive has huge tires and having a 40 horsepower advantage over the Evora it definitely definitely should be quicker I would be shocked if that was not the case now the reality is if you want the faster Evora go for the S not much more money I'll talk about that a bit more when I get in the Lotus but the thing that I'm really feeling at the moment with this particular car is just how good they are now I know that they have a serious serious reputation for engines going bang which is definitely earned it can happen it's definitely not as frequent a problem as the internet would have you believe particularly if you go for some of the earlier cars which have a dual row IMS bearing those actually tend to be quite reliable and also if you are in the market for one of these or the Evora is currently out of your price range try and get one with a lot of miles on it because in my experience it tends to be those cars that have been babied or driven gently or never used as uh, Stuttgart intended those are the ones that tend to have a problem and that can actually go for an awful lot of cars not just these but in the case of these cars should something go wrong it is awfully expensive to put it right you could be facing a bill of over ten thousand pounds if the engine in one of these goes wrong now the driving position in this feels really really classic i've forgotten how big this wheel feels and how close it is to your legs there is not a lot of room in here i've spoken to a few guys that have had elises that can't get in 911s because of clearance between knee or thigh and wheel another issue with this car it's not, not quite noisy enough for my liking in the exhaust front the owner was talking to me earlier and he's had one of the greatest problems that he has with the car particularly on longer journeys is the excessive tire roar now I don't think it's too bad but then I haven't spent too much time on it and there are a few roads around here notably the A14 where the road surface is pretty poor and the car can really really amplify the noise in my old 911 it was hideously bad you pretty much couldn't hear yourself speak oh, the stereo in this car is actually pretty good but the, the dials and the buttons and everything in here are really, really, really feeling their age. All the columns and the switch gear and stuff, you, you can so tell the Porsche was saving money with this car. And, you know, I, I'm not going to hold it against them. You know, what, what they did uh, it saved the company. The seat in this car isn't brilliant either. Under brisk and energetic driving, when you start going around the faster corners, you just kind of start to slide out the seat. It's a very comfortable seat, but it's not supportive at all and uh, can be a little bit frustrating sort of trying to hold on when you're going around a corner that being said this car does go around corners phenomenally well as I said when I began it's been a very very long time since I've driven one of these in some ways I'm I'm shocked at the thing because the the quality of the interior and a few other things are really really uh, classic <laughs> if I'm being kind to them however the drive, the pace of the thing is brilliant. You know, this would keep a lot of modern cars honest. Very, very honest. I really, really, really like the 996. I always have. I really like the 997 as well. You know, the interior in that is much improved, but underneath it is fundamentally the same car as this. And to get a generation two 997, which has the totally new engine, which doesn't have the chronic problems that this one does, you're going to have to be spending an awful lot of money. So, the question today is, if you have a little bit more money than this, you know, say £30,000 rather than £40,000, is the Evora any better? Now, we've already looked at the numbers, and they tell one sort of picture. We've looked at the interior. That's a definite plus for the Evora, but the real decider is going to be how it feels from the driver's perspective because if Lotus have a reputation for anything it's making fantastic driver's cars so if they can beat the Porsche on interior quality practicality and driving experience then you'll know that they definitely have got a winner on their hands so let's find out
Okay, so I'm in the Evora now, and if you're paying particular attention and haven't fallen asleep, you'll notice that I'm also in a different shirt because I ran out of time on the first day to get in the car and do it justice. Conveniently, I have come back to the car in almost identical weather to what I drove the 911 in, so it should be a fair and decent appraisal. The only thing that I should note, and I'm sure he'll forgive me for saying this, is that in this car I have James from Stratton Motor Company sitting with me, and neither of us were ever going to have a career as a professional jockey, so some of the Evora's uh, weight advantage may be lost, but it shouldn't hopefully affect things too much. First thing to note is how nice the car feels. It's got a lot of feel through the steering. It doesn't feel too slow either. It's 40 horsepower down on the 911, but it doesn't feel too bad. It doesn't help when lorries are trying to take up the entire road. It's not got the immediate punch the 911 does at about three grand. Gearbox is really not as good as the newer cars. It's miles away from how good the 400 is, so that's definitely a point to the Porsche. I would say steering feel is better. It's also definitely better is the noise. You can hear it an awful lot more in the Evora and it's quite a pleasant sound. More feel through the steering wheel as well. I can feel much more about the camber in the roads, what it wants to do. The car soaks up the lumps and bumps very, very well. The Porsche, as mentioned, is missing the sport suspension, which does make it a lot nicer. In these cars, there was only one suspension option, which was the correct one. A uh, fourth gear 3000 RPM, the car is definitely struggling to pick up and do much, but still carrying a reasonable amount of speed. In a straight line, the Porsche would definitely have this, but then it really, really should. Now, that being said, if outright firepower is what you need, then you can have an Evora S for only a tiny amount more than this. The whole experience from the cockpit is very, very different. You feel a bit more low. You've got a nice view out the front, which is slightly reminiscent of the Porsche. We've got lovely weather. Windscreen wiper doesn't work as well. Whether that bothers people or not, I don't know. The gearbox you get used to fairly. And second's not home. There's first. Now it's there. Strange. But like all Evoras, you get in it and you fairly quickly know what's going on. My first memory of driving an Evora, which was in February with the same man in the passenger seat, was that although I was on roads I didn't know, in a car I didn't know, in conditions that also then were actually pretty abysmal, you get a lot of confidence with the car and it talks to you. In a way that people wax lyrical about the 911 doing is something that Lotus do very, very nicely, but I think it's in a more exotic package. So I think, although you're not gonna necessarily cross country any quicker than you did before, in this car, probably a bit slower than the Porsche, you're gonna enjoy yourself at least as much the car's going to feel that much more special and more importantly you're not really sacrificing anything as we saw boot space is probably better in the Lotus rear seat space is probably as good you know if you want to go faster in a straight line get an S for only a tiny amount more you guys have the Canyon Red S for how much is that car up for 33995 33995 there you go on the road um, so that's uh, a car with another uh, that's 345 brake compared to 276 so that's a considerable amount more power for not a lot more money and these guys always have a selection of these things in so if you want one but you don't want one of these give them a shout yeah it's a nice car to drive putting your foot down coming out of a 400 like I just have and you can definitely feel a difference but you know you're talking about 120 horsepower difference you should feel a difference otherwise that means there's something wrong with the 400 rather than anything wrong with this you can very much see though why people love this when it came out because it does handle so so well if you're looking particularly for a first sports car let's say you haven't had a 911 or something but you're just looking at one and, and an Evora has cropped up this is a really friendly car it's never really going to get you into too much trouble 
it's nice, it's easy. It feels special enough from the inside, especially with this nice wraparound dash. If you get it in a nice color too, like this paprika interior, then it's a really, really cool place to be. Um, probably a very, very good and friendly introduction to Lotus ownership. If something like an Elisa or an Exige is a bit too extreme for you, then this is a very, very good place to start. It's a really nice car. I haven't yet driven an Evora that I didn't really like. So yes, there are improvements with the newer ones. Obviously you are gonna pay a little bit more money for newer models, but fundamentally they are all brilliant handling cars. And if a sports car can't handle well, then really it's not worth talking about. But these are very, very nice. If you want it to sound a bit noisier, there's plenty of guys out there like Tubular who will make a noisier exhaust. There's Lorini as well. And uh, Stuart with the white sports racer I featured recently is getting in a Lorini exhaust on his. So I'll feature that soon so you can see what they sound like. But yeah, overall, it's a cool car. And thanks to James and Stratton for lending it to me. So here's a summary. I'd not driven a 911 for nearly two years before this feature, and the 996 was always one of my favourites. Getting back in this car was a shock in a few ways. Firstly, how well it drove and went, but also quite how dated the interior had become. Although the Lotus commands more money than the 911, I think there are a number of areas where that money is well spent. Firstly, the bulletproof Toyota mechanicals are far more reliable than the Porsches of this era. Secondly, the car looks and feels like a considerably more exotic machine, both inside and out. Thirdly, it drives and in Evora S trim goes at least as well as the 911, if not better. But, crucially, with just as much space and a comfortable ride, if you have or want a 911, there is no reason that you couldn't get everything you're looking for in an Evora. So if you're in the market for a new car or an upgrade and the 911 is on your radar, give an Evora a go because it's the Lotus that you can love with your head as much as your heart and you might just not look back. I'll see you guys soon. I hope you've enjoyed the feature today. Bye bye.